Welcome to Calvary Miami Beach. Calvary is making disciples who go and make disciples. People who are rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus through the teaching of the Word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to take you back to the very beginning. You know, I was thinking about just what, what we're looking into this week, and I don't know, for some reason it just reminded me of Genesis 1.1. <clears throat> it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know, we, I think we kind of take that for granted sometimes. You know, it, it, we don't really give a lot of thought to the fact that the very ver, you know, first Verse, the very first statement in the Bible is, is this reminder that in the beginning God created everything. And then if you skip down, verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every creeping thing, or over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, stop right there. Why, why am I even going into this, you know, beginning passage of Scripture? Well, because the Word of God is really, really clear right here says that God created everything, and the idea, what's clearly stated in the original language, is that God created everything out of nothing. There was, there was you know, absolutely nothing. We can't even comprehend that. Absolutely nothing, and, and, and then God spoke, and he created everything. And he did it, the Bible says, in six evenings and mornings. In other words, six normal days. There's all kind of argument about that. But that's what the Bible tells us. Now, the reason that there's argument is that it's impossible. To me, it's a ludicrous argument to begin with. It's totally illogical to, to even have a problem with the fact that the one who could create everything out of nothing, out of nothing he, but he needed more than a week. You know what I'm saying? That's just stupid. If he could do it at all, he could do it like that, right? He did it in six days. He, did, he, he took this. He did it deliberately. I'm not going to go into all of that. Um, rather than taking a millisecond, he took a week. There's, a, I mean, a couple of sermons in that statement alone. Six days. But see, here's the thing. If you don't believe this, if you don't believe that God created everything that is out of nothing in six days, you're going to have a real problem with what we're about to read. But if you believe that, then it's not going to be any problem at all when we read about these three miracles that Jesus did, and it's going to breed, you know, kind of bring forth within you a sense of excitement and anticipation. If you believe in the Almighty, Eternal One, this passage is going to get you a little bit excited. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 says, when he, talking about Jesus, when he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years 
came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. Literally, they laughed at him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all that land. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. Excuse me. Now, I wrestled with this passage because there's so many different ways to deal with it. There's just so much packed into it that I decided we're going to spend more than one week looking at it. I'm going to take, take a look at it from one angle today and then... Greg Sabbath, and by the way, I'm super excited about Greg coming. He's a good teacher. You're going to, and he's a funny guy. Um, you're going to enjoy him next week. Then when, we, when, we come, when I come back the following week, and, and maybe even one more week, I'm not sure, but we're going to keep looking at this section of Scripture because Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, go into so much more detail about this. Mark and Luke both tell us that this quote-unquote ruler was a man by the name of Jairus, and, and he, was, he was the ruler of the synagogue. And what that meant basically was that he was the guy with the keys. He was the one, you know, so to speak. He was the one that had the, the responsibility for the facility it, itself. He would have been a prominent man in, in Capernaum, and he would have been well known because of that. Now, um, I've got a photo. I just kind of lost it in my notes, but hopefully they've, yeah, there it is. Um, the, the actual uh, remains of a synagogue in Capernaum. I say a synagogue because that one, um, archaeologists tell us, was built on top of the synagogue that we're reading about. In other words, you know, a couple of thousand years have, have passed. So the ruins of the synagogue over which Jairus had responsibility, where Jesus taught and, and where, you know, um, at least near where this all happened, um, the, the ruins of that, the, they used the roof, kind of the, the top of that one, and, and built the foundation of this one on top of the old one. Um, fascinating to go there. I encourage you, if you've not considered going to Israel, consider going with us in 2019. That's one of the places I enjoy visiting, just because there's so much to see in that um, archaeological site there at, at, at Capernaum. But Again, Mark and Luke telling us this story and, and, and giving us the account. They, they go a little further, they dig a little deeper, they expand on some of the details, and, and they tell us that, that Jairus came and, and his daughter had either just died or was on the brink of death, 12 years old, and, and he comes and, and humbles himself and falls on his face before Jesus, and, and there was a big crowd of people gathered. So he did this in front of, quote, a multitude. Now, all of this tells us that the miracles that took place were verifiable. Do you understand what I mean? It's not like if something happened in here today, you could all testify to it, right? I mean, some, some miraculous thing occurs. You could all give, give testimony, but you're not exactly a multitude. I mean, you're a lot of people, but you're not a multitude, right? Right? But what if this happened down on Lincoln Road and, and this gigantic crowd has gathered around, you know, and Jesus is there and this takes place in front of, of hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of people. Okay, now we, now we got a multitude and everybody knows Jairus. You see what I mean? Not done in a corner, not hidden away. This was, 
This was out in the open, which brings up the question, well, then why did he tell people, don't tell anybody about this? Kind of seems, we'll talk about that later. Matthew only gives us a little summary of what took place, but he gives us enough information to see three things. And the first thing I want you to see is that in each of these three miracles, Matthew points to the faith these people had in the power of the Lord Jesus. You believe I can do this? Yep. The woman came. Why? Because she said, if I can just manage to touch the, the, the hem of his robe, as he, then I'll be healed. Jairus, this ruler, he, he had no doubt. He was willing to humble himself in front of a multitude of people, fall on his face before this relatively unknown rabbi. It's interesting to think about just this woman and what she went through. You know, Matthew just says she'd been bleeding for 12 years. Now, obviously, he's not talking about all the time, every day. I mean, you know, you kind of bleed out after a little while. But she'd been hemorrhaging. Her, her, her cycle was out of control. She, she, she never got a break. She was perpetually unclean under the law of Moses. She would have been isolated from human contact. Leviticus chapter 15 verse 25 tells us that the, the law of Moses said, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs <clears throat> beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. She shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And whatever she sits on shall be unclean, as the uncleanness of her impurity. Whoever touches these things shall be unclean. He shall wash, wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she, she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the priest shall offer the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for the discharge of her uncleanness. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. Now, now give me your attention. Because one of the, I see some of you, some of you ladies are like, you, look, you got this look on your face like, What's up with that? This is not fair. It's not her fault that, you know, I mean, why, does, why is God calling her unclean? And why is she has to be separated? And if she sits on something, that's unclean. And if her bed is unclean and some, you know, some guy sits where she sat, now he's unclean and they have to go through all these. That's just, it, it, it just doesn't seem right. You know why we have that reaction? Because we misunderstand the nature of sin. We think it's something she did. It's not anything she did. It's what her great, 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 great grandmama did back in the garden. We were all born that way. What way? Impure, unclean, sinful, imperfect, messed up. Doesn't matter how you say it, it all means the same thing. None of us was born perfect. Now, sometimes people, you know, we like to think about innocent little babies, you know, that they're just, yeah, just give them a minute. <laughs> See what happens. Innocent, yes. Perfect, pure, no. They're human. And as humans, we have issues. Our impure, sinful condition is not caused by our behaviors like we think so often. According to the Bible, our impure, sinful condition is the cause of our behaviors. It's because we're impure. It's because we're contaminated by sin that we behave the way we do. 
We're in need of divine intervention. This woman, the, the, the two blind men, Jairus' little girl, they, they all had a condition which they could not change on their own. But they believed that Jesus could change it. And he can change your condition too. If you came here today looking for answers, Jesus has the answers. The Bible even argues Jesus is the answer. But sometimes that's a little cryptic and it's like, what? I'm going to give you the opportunity to turn your life over to him and receive new life from him before we're done today. But this woman in Matthew chapter 9, she violated the law. This mandate to stay away from other people. Because she believed that Jesus could fix her. He could make her whole. He could make her clean. The blind men who came to him, they came to him believing that he could do the impossible. And give them their sight. Jairus came to Jesus, believing that Jesus could raise his daughter from the dead. What do you need to believe Jesus for? The second thing that we see here is that in all three of these situations, these people acted on their faith and pursued Jesus. Jairus left the bedside of his little 12-year-old daughter to come and beg Jesus to do something utterly impossible. I mean, we read this, and because we know who Jesus is, it really is not that striking unless we take a minute and contemplate what it was he was doing. How absurd. I mean, what would you think? Just, what would you think? If somebody came running in here right now and, and just fell on their face in front of me and started begging me to come with them and raise their daughter from the dead, what would you think about that? I mean, we, we would understand the desperation, right? My baby girl just died. You got to do something. And see, it's important that we remember that these people, this multitude that was gathered around, they didn't, they didn't know that Jesus was any different from Pastor Robert. The, the name Jesus, Joshua, in, in, you know, the, the Hebrew name, it was a common name. It was a normal name. It was just, he was just another rabbi, self-proclaimed. He hadn't studied under anybody else. Self-proclaimed teacher. It's pretty radical what's going on here. So, why did Jairus come to Jesus instead of going to one of the more well-known rabbis? Do you understand there were some really well-known rabbis in Israel? One of them, Gamaliel, is still quoted today among or within Orthodox Judaism. He was famous. He's still famous. Why, why did this woman risk punishment by pushing her way through the multitude until she could touch the hem of his garment? Why did the blind men come to Jesus asking for healing because they had heard of his power to change people's lives the stories were already circulating about the miracles that he had done they had heard from somebody this one can do something Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. In other words, how are people going to hear about his power unless somebody says something? See, we read this, we, the, the thing about preacher trips us up, and you think about me. But this is not about some guy preaching on Sunday morning. This is talking about some, someone who has seen the power of Jesus and just has to tell somebody. Your daughter died, but Jesus can, he can raise her from the dead. You don't understand. You're blind. He can, he can give you your sight. Yeah, that's going to be a conversation later. <laughs> that's my wife, for those of you who don't know. Uh-huh. Probably my daughter. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I recognize the, the ringtone, my daughter calling from California. Man, oh, man. <laughs> Listen, has Jesus touched your life already? Then you have a duty to talk about it. You have an obligation to say something. Again, in Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. But do you understand what Paul is, is writing there? You and I are in debt. He bought us with his blood. He's given us life. We who were dead, according to the Bible. Not physically dead, like Jairus' little 12-year-old daughter, but spiritually dead. We were dead. We had no connection to God. His spirit wasn't inside us. And we didn't somehow earn his intervention. He, he loves us. He made provision. And he intervened. And we have a duty to talk about it. Somebody told these people. Somebody told the blind man, hey, that guy Jesus that's healing people and giving them their sight, he's in town. You see what I mean? Somebody said something. And believing the testimonies that they heard, they acted in faith. And that brings us to the third and final point. I'm going to ask the band to come on back up. I want you to notice that, that these people who came to Jesus in faith actually received from the Lord Jesus what they asked for. So important that we don't miss this. In the book of James, the Bible tells us, you have not because you ask not, or because you ask amiss, because you just want to spend it on yourself. It's all, you're making it all about you. So, two reasons that we don't receive from God. We don't bother to ask, or we're asking from a self-centered, self-indulgent motive. Everything's about me. These, these people came in, in faith. They, they took action and, and, and they came to him and they, they, they asked him, would you please give my baby girl back to me? Would you give me my eyesight? The woman didn't even ask. 
right? She just reached out. And Jesus stopped, which he did not have to do. He turned and he made contact with this woman for the first time. Now, I can't promise you that he's going to do whatever you ask him to do. Sometimes he says no. If that's the most loving thing for him to do, then that's, that's what he's going to do. He's not a genie that grants people three wishes. He's a loving God who knows what we need and is committed to taking good care of us. If we come to him in faith. And he may not fix all your problems. But I can promise you that he will fix you if you sincerely ask him to. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. My final thought, if you say you trust him, but you never act on the faith that you think you have, you're self-deceived. Faith produces action. If you trust God, there's absolutely no doubt that we'll be able to see that in your life. Father, I pray for these people who've gathered here this morning. Lord, the ones who've been touched by you. That they wouldn't be able to be silent. That they would be incapable of withholding that good news that you're the God who fixes people. And the, one, the ones who came here this morning looking for answers or hoping that you're real, I pray God for them that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would personally show up. I want to ask you to keep your heads bowed and keep your eyes closed just for another couple of minutes. And I want to give you the opportunity to, to just cry out to God. As a, as a young man, I got really frustrated with church. It was just always boring and it seemed to be completely ineffectual. It, it was just, I came to a, to a place where I, I just, why am I doing this? There's, there's nothing there, there's nothing happening, there's nothing real, and, and most of the people who go don't even really believe it. But then as a young adult, I had a, a very real encounter with Jesus himself. It wasn't in church. There was nobody else around. It was just Jesus. And I realized this stuff, it's all true. And the fact that there are a lot of people pretending and living hypocritical lives, that's, that's really irrelevant. I mean, if it's true, if he's really alive, then the hypocrites, well, that's their problem. And I, I, I soon sought out a church to be a part of because I wanted to be with other people who had had that kind of encounter with God. Some of you have, some of you haven't. But he wants it for all of us. Just like he wanted it for Jairus and he wanted it for the two blind men. He wanted it for that woman and he, and he wanted it for, the, for those disciples who followed him around. He wants it for you. He 
wants you to know him. And the songs that we sing and the prayers that we pray and the rituals that we go through, it's, it, it's just all about reminders and object lessons and training us to put things in perspective and, and to not get bogged down in this life and to remember he rose from the dead, he's alive. And he fixes people. If that's what you need right now, the Bible says it's free. He came and paid for everything by being executed. It was a Roman cross because they didn't have electric chairs back in those days. They didn't yet use injections or gas chambers. They, they, they just nailed people to a tree. And so that's what happened to him. The cross became a holy thing because the Son of God offered himself on one. He paid for everything so that <clears throat> you and I could be pardoned. Could enter into a relationship with God. A friendship with God. Become part of His family. And if you want that this morning, He's offering it to you right now for free. If you want Him to be the God of your life, <clears throat> then just tell him so. Just tell him that you need him to fix you. You need him to do a work inside you that you can't do for yourself. And you need him to, to start leading you and teaching you and helping you. He already knows that, but if you'll just acknowledge it, he'll go to work inside you. And if that's what's happening right now, I'd love to pray for you. If you just raise your hand, that's all I'm going to ask you to do. I'll pray for you good awesome good anybody else father thank you for these <clears throat> lord who have opened up to you this morning and they're asking you to do something inside their hearts inside their lives that, that you're in, we're incapable of doing for ourselves only our creator can recreate and change us and so I agree with their prayers. I ask you to change them. I ask you to fill them with your Holy Spirit. Make them new on the inside. Begin leading them and teaching them and training them and, and even using them as messengers to tell other people how awesome you are, how good you are. <clears throat> I ask you to surround them with other people who know you and love you and want to serve you and give them opportunities to, to be witnesses for you in the world. Give them a hunger to know the truth, to search the scriptures. To become one of your disciples and to go and talk to other people and ask your blessing on them, God. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close in worship. The altar team's already up here. If you raised your hand a minute ago, or if you just need prayer for something, please come up and see them at the end of the service. Let them pray with you. Would you stand? God.